Our next uh, speaker and our next panel, David Miranda is our Advanced Heart Failure uh, Transplant Fellow, and he will be uh, presenting a case uh, for the panel. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, the intersection or a little bit of between the percutaneous valve interventions and uh, heart failure, and we're going to do uh, a case, and we're going to discuss it with the panel, and then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about specifically functional MR and uh, a little bit of how, as I said, it intersects with heart failure and OSS advanced heart failures and um, structural heart disease. So um, as heart failure cardiologists and the valvular heart disease, um, I, I think it's really important because this is very common in patients with heart failure. Uh, the, the outcomes uh, of patients with severe heart failure, low EF, in valvular disease is poor. And then uh, frequently we see patients that have mitral valve surgery, and uh, in the next, ne next six to 12 months, they are referred for LVAD or transplant. Also, uh, one of the, out the outline that we're gonna talk is how the structural heart disease therapy, how it improves and saves lives in uh, advanced stages of heart failure. So um, there's a, a different paradigm in terms of uh, heart failure in structural heart disease because uh, I think at the beginning of my training, I saw this as separate entities, and then as I progressed during my training, I saw that there was a lot, a lot of uh, overlap between uh, these two specialties, and a lot of people with um, advanced heart failure, as I said, they had structural um, procedures, and we referred them to uh, the, uh, the structural cardiologist. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and start with the case. So this is a 61-year-old male, so he has coronary artery disease. He had a bypass uh, times two. So back in 1995 and 2008, uh, he has an ischemic cardiomyopathy with an EF that has been between 25 and 30 percent and has been stable. Uh, he has a VIB ICD in uh, 2011. So just an idea of the time frame. He has hypertension. He has history of AFib, and he had a prior stroke in 2010. So a pretty pretty typical patient that we see. Uh, on a daily basis in clinic or as an inpatient. So um, he comes to clinic and uh, he, he tells us that he's been more tired than usual and that his functional status has been uh, getting worse. He also has a recent admission with a decompensated heart failure. Um, here are his vitals. So his blood pressure is 130 over 50 and a heart rate of 53. Um, currently his medications that he's on, he's on Corec, uh, he's on Entresto, Spironolactone, Lipitor. Uh, he was on Nalapril, but it was switched to Entresto. And then he's on Hydralazin, Imdur, and Warfarin. So pretty typical heart failure uh, therapy for, for this patient. Uh, here are the labs. So pretty, pretty normal uh, renal function, stable hemoglobin. Um, so Dave, can you go back a slide? So, so, you know, one of the things that we want to make sure these patients are really optimized in their medical therapy, it looks like he's Heart rate's slow, but blood pressure is still pretty decent. So I was wondering what kind of doses of Entresto and hydralazine is this, Imdur, is this gentleman on? So uh, despite that blood pressure, he, um, he had significant symptoms of feeling very tired. In, uh, so Entresto, he was started at low dose, and he was tolerating that okay, but then with the Coric, we couldn't go up higher than 12.5. And, and that was basically because of feeling tired. Uh, that was the main, the main issue. But uh, other than those two medications, he was on uh, good doses of the other, of, of target doses of spironolacto and hydralazine and MD. But, but yeah, I agree that blood pressure could be managed uh, or can be titrated down a little bit more. So uh, as I said, uh, he used to walk 1.5 miles, uh, but for the last six months, his functional status has been uh, getting worse. So a little bit of the echocardiogram, um, and I'm going to show the pictures here, but basically of note, the importance is that his uh, ventricle was dilated at 6.9 centimeters. He had moderate RV dysfunction. And uh, we'll, we'll look uh, at, at the echocardiogram pictures here soon. So this is the x-ray that I want to show that has, uh, he has some congestion on, on his x-ray. And of note, it's important that uh, he has the IV ICD and as uh, Dr. Trachtenberg alluded, we try to optimize as much as possible this patient. So uh, from a heart failure therapy standpoint, he was on 
good medical therapy, and from a device standpoint, he he was already he already had cardiac resynchronization therapy, and despite all this, uh, he his functional status was poor. So here's the echocardiogram, and um, so the first image here in the parsternal lung, we can see that uh, the LV is dilated uh, with a poor EF. Uh, and then the mitral valve doesn't have any major structural uh, abnormalities. It's more of a functional um, mitral regurgitation in terms of uh, dilation of the LV. So the leaflets do not co opt appropriately. Uh, in, in this four chamber view here, uh, we can see the So the uh, ICD is here, and then uh, the dilated LV with the same things of the, the mitral valve with a dil dilated LV. This way? Um, with that dilated LV and uh, the function of MR with no co-optation of the, of the valves. So, so here is uh, more of the Doppler uh, that we can see that functional MR with a posteriorly directed jet and um, in pretty severe in nature. Dr. Little, any comments on the echo? Uh, I think David hit most of the big, big items there. I mean, it's a very dilated ventricle. The systolic function is clearly very impaired. Um, you know, the real issue uh, comes down to the mechanism of MR. And, um, you know, 10 years ago, we just called it MR. Um, for the last several years, there's been an increasing focus on categorizing the mitral regurgitation as either primary, related to the leaflets as the primary cause of dysfunction, or secondary, meaning the primary problem is the ventricle uh, with tethering of the cords and a structurally normal valve that's just being pulled apart. Um, it's nice in a young person when it's clearly one or the other. Um, the reality is in, in much of our elderly population, it's a mixture. We have elements that are functional with LV dilation and, and tethering, but you also have some, some focal thickening and perhaps even some prolapse of the leaflet. So the concept is important, and I think as you've, you've, just, you've said, David, this is primarily um, functional or secondary MR, which, is, yep. uh, which puts the sort of the therapeutic conversation in a very different category. Okay. So um, a little bit of, uh, I wanted to allude the management and outcomes of uh, moderate to severe functional MR in patients with uh, reduced EF. So um, basically, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's a meta-analysis of uh, 1,400 patients and they follow up for 4.7 uh, years, and this is patients, as I said, with severely reduced EF and uh, dilated ventricle with uh, end diastolic dimension and systole, and, and the end diastolic uh, dimension of 55 millimeters with a median age of 64 and 40% women, that basically uh, the question if medical therapy does really affect uh, this uh, disease or the progression of this disease. So uh, most of the patients uh, were on medical therapy. Uh, they had interventions, 8% only, CAP 6%, and surgery only 7%, uh, either with revascularization or surgery, or mitral valve surgery, and only surgery alone uh, was the minority. But basically, uh, there is no change in the outcomes or uh, the natural history of these disease. And despite that, uh, the guidelines are pretty, um, I, I will say, pretty not helpful in terms of the medical therapy with this patient. So basically, they give a 2A recommendation for patients on medical therapy, and specifically vasodilator therapy. They give uh, three, uh, three recommendations that there's no benefit for uh, vasodilator therapy on, on mitral valve disease. Also, um, New therapies are coming, and uh, uh, MitraClip is one of the new therapies, and we're going to talk about it a little bit because uh, th this is, I'm doing this with, as a segue to what the patient had in the discussion. So this is the Everest uh, registry, and this, this, this is the, the trial that gave uh, the evidence for the clinical trial uh, that is the co-op trial. And basically, in green here, we can see the patients that had medical therapy, and in red, we, we see the patients that have mitral clip. And in every single, uh, this is the EF, this is the, the, the systolic dimension of the LV, this is the L, LA volume, and this is the uh, 
the volume of the LV itself. So in patients in green, uh, we can see that the medical therapy didn't affect any of the parameters, but in, in red, uh, with the mitral clip, we see that there's decrease in, re in reverse remodeling. Also, um, the, the mantra of that the EF drops and patient can do words after mitral sur surgery, it's important to know that that has been changing in, and we know that that is not the case anymore. So on the left, we have the stroke volume and preload, and there's always the say that uh, the mitral valve, if we have severe MR, it acts as a scape valve for the LV. And sometimes, usually, we underestimate uh, or the LV dysfunction with patients with mitral valve. So after mitral surgery, we see that the preload uh, decreases and the stroke volume uh, also decreases a little bit. But at the same time, we're decreasing the afterload uh, of, of the LV and improving the overall outcome of the, of the LV. So, so that is something important to note in terms of the pressure volume loops after mitral valve surgery. So, um, so the patient underwent the procedure and I wanna show, this is the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure before the mitral clip. So, so the wedge was tw around 26 uh, and clearly causing him to be short of breath, very symptomatic. And immediately after, uh, we can see, not immediately, but uh, the right heart cat that we did after the procedure, he clearly has an improvement in the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure with improvement in his symptoms. So um, I will, I will ask Dr. Little a little bit of help here uh, for the 3D images uh, of the procedure itself. So this is, this is uh, the TE images before. Well, I'll just, I'll just comment a little bit. So the decision-making around this patient is clearly that she's, he has a significant MR that's secondary, has symptoms, has, and I think we can probably agree, is you know, a optimal guideline-directed heart failure medical therapy, uh, including resynchronization. So really the choices are just carry on as is with no structural intervention. That's always an option. Uh, in this case, he's probably not going to do well with that option. Uh, consider a percutaneous solution or repair of the valve, which we'll talk about here, uh, or a surgical solution. Um, so it's not necessarily off the table to consider surgery. Most of the times when functional MR is being addressed surgically, it's usually in the context of uh, also having uh, revascularization surgery. So if you're there getting a bypass, it's an easier decision, but to subject a patient to surgery uh, directly for functional MR, uh, the outcomes generally uh, aren't great for in the long term, We're talking, you know, lack of significant MR two or three years later. So generally, it's an approach that is not, mm -hmm. um, uh, not taken. Tom, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I, I think that uh, certainly the uh, first uh, severe ischemic mitral regurgitation, the surgical results in terms of survival benefit is not there. Uh, uh, and if you, if you look at um, uh, sort of functional improvement, uh, symptomatic improvement, there is benefit, uh, but it, uh, paradoxically, over for, for many years, we have always thought that mitral valve repair was a better surgical treatment than mitral valve replacement, and, and in ischemic mitral regurgitation for symptomatic improvement, uh, probably uh, there's good data to show that mitral valve replacement is probably better, whether that's better than transcatheter therapy. Uh, and the fact that he had already two bypasses, will that lean you towards one way or another in, in terms of decision making for the therapy of this patient? In, in, in what way? Like do percutaneous rather than an open surgery? I guess in the sense of uh, high surgical risk. Yeah. So I, I think that risk has to be weighed with benefit. And, and I think that certainly somebody who's had two previous coronary operations, I mean, there's increased risk to it. But I think in the absence of benefit, it would make it not be, uh, it, it, unless there was no other option, I would, I would think that if you could do a transcatheter uh, option that may improve this patient's symptoms, that may be the better way to go. So, so the reason that in this case, transcatheter uh, option is sort of preferred 
is that the benefit, at least probably at the time of this case, was unknown, although I hope mm -hmm. this patient uh, contributed to the co-op data set, which we'll talk about. So even if benefit is not sure, the risk is low. And the reason the risk is low is this is effectively mostly a, a venous procedure. So if anybody's not familiar with what the mitral clip procedure actually is, the device itself is this little sort of fabric covered clip. It's almost like a fancy staple. Uh, and it's delivered via catheter. So you go through the right, generally right side, uh, femoral vein, large sheath, deliver this device uh, in a catheter up to the right atrium. And then with the 3D echo, you guide a little needle puncture from the right atrium to the left atrium. So now you've gained left heart access. Then you put a wire through, a larger catheter, and then you deliver this little fabric covered clip into the beating heart of uh, beating left heart. Uh, and then without stopping the heart, uh, this is a cath lab procedure, not, not considered a surgical procedure, as the you know, patient is sedated with anesthesia inv involved, but in some places in Europe, they're even doing this with conscious sedation. Uh, and as the heart is beating, you put this little clip in, you time it with echo guidance, you grab the leaflets of the mitral valve, the anterior and the posterior, and you sort of just clip them together. That's why it's called a mitral clip. Uh, and what that does is it improves the part of the co-optation because the leaflets have been pulled apart by a sick ventricle. So you're sort of forcing the center of the leaflets to still touch. So all you're doing is you're reducing the amount of mitral regurgitation. Expectation is you go from severe regurg to probably mild. You generally never get to zero regurgitation. It's not as good a procedure as what a good surgeon would do, but it doesn't require a sternotomy or, or heart line bypass. So that's the trade-off. Um, so delivering a fabric-covered clip to the valve is, is, the, is the, sort of the nature of the procedure. So this is an uh, echocardiogram after the procedure. So uh, as Dr. Little is alluding, uh, the, the clip is in place. And as we can see and compare with the prior images, uh, the, mitra, the mitral regurgitation from severe to mild. Um, so here's the 3D images. Uh, of this the is an interprocedural clip. clip, so that's, you see the catheter coming across the septum, that thing, it looks like a little V. That's the clip itself, it's in a closed position right now, and it's being positioned across from the left, that's the left atrium view you're looking at, the top of the heart looking down, the thing that's opening and closing is the mitral valve, and you pass the catheter down into the left ventricle, then you open up the clip arms, you pull it back, grabbing the anterior and posterior leaflet, and then you close the clip, like a closed peg, and let's see what your next video shows. The what? Close by. Close by. So here's the T, the intraop uh, T, and um, it's basically what we're seeing in the 3D, but uh, in a 2D fashion, it's both in a uh, three chamber and a four chamber zoom way. And it's basically the clip pla being placed and um, the MR being reduced. So uh, to, to finish, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the co op trial that. Uh, was released last year and created a, little, a lot of uh, exposure on Twitter, as Dr. we were alluding before. Um, so basically, we the, the comparison was patients on medical therapy versus uh, the mitral clip. And these patients were randomized and were scrutinized very, uh, very well because they had a combined um, group of heart failure cardiologists. They have a surgeon, a cardiac surgeon, and they have an inter, uh, interventional in as well as an echocardiographer uh, as part of the team. And so it was a very well done trial. In uh, in the first part of the graph here, we see the outcomes of patients that uh, the hospitalization part. So the curves are are clear uh, are clearly um, evident. Where in the control group up there, patients were hospitalized more often. And then here we have the mortality. So in medicine in general, the number needed to treat is always high. And um, this was a big discussion at uh, AHA when it was released that the number needed to treat for this uh, therapy for both hospitalization and mortality was really low. So you need to do three procedures to prevent uh, hospitalization and six procedures to prevent a death in, uh, in, in, with this therapy. So. If you can go back one slide, David, I just want to yeah. quickly comment on that slide. So this, this study we were involved in, we enrolled quite a lot of patients. It was a long, difficult trial, and one of the reasons it was very difficult to complete is that the heart failure therapies were so good at getting rid of MR. So we would have these patients referred to the valve clinic. We, they would have severe functional MR. The mandate of the protocol was that everybody had to be seen by a heart failure specialist, maximal um, tolerated guideline-directed therapy. 
and then repeat the echo. And when we did that, a lot of times the MR went to mild. Um, so we couldn't do anything with them. Um, so the study was really that process and then a randomization. Half the patients got the clip on a top of the guideline direct therapy and half did not. And then when this data came out in the fall, um, people were amazed at how positive it was. So this was unique and you've got the headline at the bottom, but only three patients had to be treated with the clip to save a life. So the number needed to treat is a very small number. You put that in context with defibrillators, with every medical therapy, nothing else. I think in the heart, in the heart failure, uh, armamentarium has that sort of impact. But I think the important message here is, and I think you've talked about the other study, is that the patient selection was also one of the challenges in this, this uh, study. You had to have a ventricle that wasn't too big. You had to have an EF that wasn't too low. You, know, you couldn't be sort of end-stage heart failure with some MR. Um, and maybe you'll talk a little bit about the other uh, study that's led to some of the controversy. Well, I just want to echo what, what Dr. Little said. So as one of the heart failure cardiologists involved in this trial, you know, I, I've never been a part of a trial that was so stringent in terms of making sure they're on goal-directed medical therapy. So we would have to present these patients to a group of heart failure cardiologists and, and, and the surgeons um, for each patient we enrolled. And if they were on 12.5 of Carvedilol twice a day or, you know, 10 milligrams of lisinopril, they would say, why are they not on 25 of Colreg twice a day? Why are they not on 40 of lisinopril? Have you tried it? If not, you, you, you have to try it or have a good reason why they failed it in the past to really meet criteria for the trial. So it really was, the design was, was very good. And one other thing I wanted to ask uh, Dr. McGilvery about is the, the STS score. That was also a big part of the trial. And I know you're involved in, in the leadership for the STS database, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. And the average score, I think, was around seven, seven to eight for this patient population. If you, any comments about what that means in terms of the surgical risk and, and how the trial addressed that? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure I totally understand the question. I mean, mitral valve surgery, certainly mitral valve replacement surgery with coronary disease uh, is, you know, has a risk somewhere in the mid to high single digits, uh, uh, just, I think, because of the nature of the patient population. Uh, you know, I think that, um, uh, as I said earlier, mitral valve surgery for patients with ischemic uh, uh, heart disease, for ischemic uh, mitral regurgitation has not been a very uh, gratifying, satisfying therapy. And it's, you can say, I mean, it, as, as good as this is, I mean, it's interesting to see, even in the device group, I mean, the, the, the two-year uh, mortality rate is significant. And I do think it speaks to the nature of the problem is I imagine over the next 12 to 36 months after that, that curve will continue to look, uh, will probably continue to converge. I have a question. Um, uh, did, uh, David, what happened to the patient? Did he symptomatically improve? And number two, since we know by the pathophysiology, we are taking some of the effective stroke volume out. Mm -hmm. Were, was, did he need to be uh, down titrated on his medications? So he's symptomatically better, so he's walking more, and he feels better. Uh, but no, the, the medications were not, do you, you mean decreasing dose? No. Okay. And I think it's part of uh, what, um, what this slide is coming up in terms of the remodeling. Uh, and, and, and here's just the last part of that trial that I want to talk. So initially I talked about medical therapy, and as Dr. Little said, that there's reverse, re reverse remodeling with heart, with heart failure therapy. But um, here, as, as they showed this in, in the study, at baseline, at baseline, uh, the LV size in the medical therapy that is the blue, it increased. But uh, the size that the of the the size of the ventricle in the patients that it got the clip clearly reduced. So there's now a hypothesis generating idea that also uh, the device has re remodeling or reverse remodeling effects. Same thing happens with mitral valve surgery. Yeah, but the, for the patients the, that are not right. So I think we we just have to time will tell. Yes, I agree. Dr. Little, you, since you were involved in, 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 in a lot of these patients and saw the, in the echo, doing the echo while they're getting the, 
procedure and helping guide the, the, the interventionalist. Any comments on anatomy that was challenging? It was, is there an LV size that is too big to really benefit from, from a single clip? How often were you doing more than one clip? Yeah, so <clears throat> we've, we've done somewhere close to 200 uh, microclip patients, and I think our collective average is about you know, 1.7. So it's, you know, most patients end up with one or two clips. With a functional case, you're more likely to require two clips. Um, that's not really uh, the challenge of the case. The, the, challenge, the most challenging element of, of this whole treatment paradigm is, is picking the right patients. Um, that's really the challenge. And that's where a lot of the editorials in the last six months in, in the wake of the COAP study and, and another smaller French study that had a different result uh, using the same device. And we could talk about that for an hour. But at the end of the day, all of that message is that the patient selection is critical and that um, the very large ventricle, the very poor EF, who happens to have mitral regurgitation, uh, we can almost always make the echo look better um, if that's our goal. But when the goal is to make the patient feel better, there is an EF and a ventricular dysfunction beyond which no amount of clipping is going to help. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the, the current effort is to try to figure out on that continuum of secondary MR with bad ventricles. There's a population where a clip-like therapy will be helpful, and there's a population where it will be useless. And that's where a lot of the effort is to try to figure that out right now. Just as an aside, so today the mitroclip therapy in the United States is only approved commercially for primary MR. Um, so these patients like this come to our clinic today. We don't have an easy mechanism to treat them because the, the device is not commercially approved. In Europe, there's no restriction. Uh, it's primary and secondary. So a lot of the data and the impetus for the study come from European data. But we know that this is in front of the FDA now that was a very, very impactful uh, unidirectional trial with clear benefits. So we expect in the next few months, maybe three to six months, that the FDA will approve this device for this patient population. Um, and when that happens, I think the important take home message is that this device was not compared uh, against uh, uh, medical therapy. Every single patient had optimal aggressive medical therapy. So we have to, there's the fear is that the device will be used instead of medical therapy. Uh, medical therapy is absolutely still the mainstay, and then this will be layered on top. Steve and, and Tom, I guess if, if I'm in the regular practice out of big medical centers, I have a patient with shortness of breath, EF is 40% severe MR. I think they're all optimized. I don't have a valve clinic to send to. Should I send them to the surgeon first, or should I, should I be sending them to a, a mitraclip person if there's no valve team concept? And I guess in a different way, Tom, when would you commit these individuals to a surgical uh, repair in, in a secondary MR, as much as right now it's controversial, especially that you very astutely pointed out while we're celebrating the difference, the two-year outcome is still not that great. Well, I guess I can, so I think certainly it being ischemic MR, I think if there is a question of ischemic heart disease, uh, I think the benefit that you can still get from patients with ischemic MR is the treatment of their ischemia. Uh, so I think when combined with surgical revascularization and uh, mitral valve surgery, uh, there, there may be patients who will benefit from that. Uh, in patients who, uh, who have an ischemic cardiomyopathy and ischemic MR and there really isn't anything to, uh, to revascularize, uh, then uh, I would think that it should, be a def it should be a therapy that's reserved for somebody who can't get uh, a clip, in my opinion. I'll answer to, to your question about sort of referral patterns or suggested referral patterns. I would say in the community, the first goal should be to determine, um, you know, what is the severity of MR and what's the mechanism. Mm -hmm. and, and if it's clearly primary MR, then you, the referral then is to somebody who can treat the primary MR, which is either a surgeon or um, someplace like a valve clinic that they can do clipping and other therapies. But if it's clearly secondary MR, so MR in the presence of a bad ventricle, um, the focus of therapy should be the ventricle. Um, and if that's local, if that's a referral to a heart failure team, uh, that should happen first, um, because in our experience, particularly with this COAP study, we had it the other way around. We had many bad valves who happened to have bad ventricles sent to us, and all we could do is send it to heart failure, uh, and most of those bad valves got better. So 
I think it's the ventricle focus first and the valve is secondary. Yeah. All right. Thank you, David, uh, for the presentation. Thank you to the panelists.